in the name of the Creator, the Redeemer, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. Again, we are invited to hear about justice or the lack of justice with the division set up between the rich and the poor. The lessons in Psalm for today lead us in this direction. Spoil alert. If some of us are wealthy, this is not an attack upon your success with monetary gain. If some of us are poor, this is not a judgment on our inability to achieve riches. For those of us in the middle, we just keep trucking, don't we? As I mentioned last week, these lessons we hear at this time of year are an attempt to focus our awareness of these continued divisions we have in society between the haves and the have-nots. These readings also remind us of what our roles as Jews, Christians, and Muslims, the people of the book, demand of us in this earthly life. It is also about our relationships with God and wealth that are being examined. This connection pretty much screams at us to take a look at this and measure how each of us is doing. Tempted, and I mean really tempted as I am to talk about each one, I'm only going to concentrate on Luke's parable we heard today. Luke is at it again, isn't he? Last week we heard the same opening line, there was a rich man. Do you think Luke was envious of the wealthy and just had to ding them every chance he got? What is going on with him? Here we have another parable about a rich man, and it is definitely more disturbing than the parable about the dishonest manager. Before we look into this week's parable, however, we need to view the passage that connects these two parables about the rich. After Jesus told the parable of the dishonest manager or the manager of injustice, he said, you cannot serve God and wealth. Luke is not being mean-spirited about the wealthy because there were wealthy people who understood Jesus' message and were able to serve God and others with their riches. The early followers of Jesus needed people of wealth to help with their communities. Luke's problem with the wealthy was towards those who valued their material goods above their relationship with God and with serving others. Luke's linking passage between these two parables says, The Pharisees, who were lovers of money, heard all this and they ridiculed him. So Jesus said to them, you are those who justify yourselves in the sight of others, but God knows your hearts, for what is prized by human beings is an abomination in the sight of God. When we set ourselves above all others with material goods that have really become our idols, then we are out of relationship with God. It goes back to serving the two masters, impossibility. Our riches, and in the eyes of many in the world, and for some in our own country, we do possess riches. We may not regard ourselves as such, but we are mostly comfortable in our way of life. Poverty and wealth existed in Jesus' time just as it does today. And Luke isn't saying that all the Pharisees were wealthy but he implies that the ones who were tagging along in opposition to Jesus' teachings were lovers of money, were people who prized their status as being righteous in their thoughts and actions. They put themselves above the lowly, the impoverished, and those who stood outside the acceptable boundaries of the community. The mention that these Pharisees ridiculed Jesus certainly puts them in that group. And Jesus goes on to challenge them with mention of the law and the prophets and examples of how they have not been obeyed because the hearts of the Pharisees have been turned away from loving God in all aspects of life. And this brings us to the parable for today. We have two characters, and let's really look at the descriptions Luke gave about both of them and examine their relationship with each other. 
There was a rich man. How do we know he was rich? He was dressed in purple, the color that only the wealthy were privileged and could afford to wear, and fine linen, not rough, homespun cloth. This man feasted sumptuously, even that word, sumptuously. He did not just eat the basic food groups, but dined on exquisite types of food in great amounts, with fine wines, olives, amazing yogurt, not talking about Dan and her yogurt right now, <laughs> meats, fish, and cheeses, perhaps. He certainly did not go hungry because he did this every day. No growling belly for him. Now we do not know if he kicked at his food or whether he gorged himself, but we do know he must have had a great appetite to do this every day. So hunger for him was not the issue. His house had a gate around its perimeter. Was this for security reasons? Was this to protect his inner sanctum of this great food? Landscape gardens, reflecting pools, fine furniture, objects of gold, beautiful carpets, cushions, and elaborate decorations? Or was the gate merely to keep the riffraff outside? Whatever the reason for this gate, this was also a sign of wealth. The rich man has no name. However, did you notice that? Now, a Latin name was given to him at one point, Divas, which meant rich, but he has no personal name to identify him or his family. Perhaps this was done on purpose so that anyone could supply someone's name to fit this description. He is virtually nameless throughout, however. So let's turn to Lazarus. He did have a name, and it meant God helps. At the beginning of our story, this did not seem possible. The rich man had to be the pious, God-fearing man because he had been given all this wealth. Think of Job. A true measurement of his worthiness and reward from God. Everyone knew that. But what description was given for Lazarus? Lazarus lay at the rich man's gate. For how long? Had it been days? Had this just happened? Why did the rich man not notice? Why did the rich man not stoop to help or at least inquire as to what the problem was? And Lazarus was covered with sores. Why? Well, leprosy is not mentioned, so was this just a result of an extremely poor diet? Was it a result of severe vitamin deficiency? Well, he would have been deemed unworthy of touch, certainly by the rich man, right? He certainly could not have touched Lazarus because the rich man would have been ritually unclean, a point recognized by the Pharisees who listened to this parable. And does the Good Samaritan parable come to mind at this point? Lazarus was so hungry that he could only long to satisfy his hunger with what fell from the rich man's table. He was never at the table, mind you. He could only dream of the possibilities of catching crumbs or grabbing a piece of bread that had been used to wipe off the grease from the diner's hands or perhaps a rotten grape that had been discarded from the clump of juicy ones that were served on fine platters. And then if he were fortunate to get any of these pieces, Lazarus would have had to fight off any dogs that might have been there, and who would have been stronger at getting the crumbs first. And what about these dogs? These were the dogs outside the gates, probably not any treasured pets of the rich man. These were outcasts, strays, perhaps even wild dogs that foraged the neighborhood for scraps. They at least stopped by and noticed Lazarus and would come and lick his sores. Notice, even the dogs would come. This suggests to me that Lazarus had been there longer for one day. Lazarus dies. Starvation? Did the dogs get too greedy over a week of prey? We do not know the exact cause. But he dies, and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. Lazarus, in death, 
but is finally given special notice and care. The rich man dies, don't know why. High cholesterol from all that sumptuous eating. Heart attack from overeating and not exercising. But this rich man is just buried. Doesn't seem to be much pomp and circumstance, no wailing, no lavish funeral procession. And what is his reward? To go to Hades, not quite hell, but not heaven, that's for sure, where he is in torment. Now the positions have been reversed, haven't they? The rich man, still no name, sees Lazarus at Abraham's bosom, a place of wondrous happiness for any Jewish person, and he cannot believe his eyes. The shock he must have felt at this topsy-turvy sight. He tells Abraham to send Lazarus with water-dipped finger to cool his parched and tormented throat. The rich man not only still barks orders to this impoverished man, but knows his name. So Lazarus was known to him before his death. Had Lazarus been a servant who had been cast out due to his skin condition? Had he been a loyal slave who had been abandoned and ignored and not been treated well by his rich master? Everything is different now. Lazarus is now the recipient of rewards and the rich man suffers. Son, remember that in our lifetime you received good things while Lazarus received bad things. But now he is comforted here and you are in agony. Not only is this true, but now a great chasm has been fixed so that those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over from there to us. The rich man's easy living is no more. When he pleads for Abraham to send Lazarus again, the rich man still orders Lazarus to do work for him, to warn his brothers so they don't suffer the same fate. Abraham delivers another shocker to the rich man. If they cannot follow Moses and the prophets, there is nothing that can be done, even if someone rises from the dead, a reference to what will happen with Jesus. What do you suppose the Pharisees thought about this? Jesus knew some of them would still not get it after that blessed Easter morning. To follow Jesus was and is a lifelong journey. To love God is to give every breath, every action, and every thought to God by loving and serving others. We cannot ignore those who do not share our similar lifestyles. We cannot overlook those who seem less than what our society considers acceptable. This does not mean we have to starve or give up our means of living. It just means we are to share what God has given us. It means to open our hearts to others and be participants of this good news that Jesus has given us. George Buttrick wrote, The story offers no support to the glib assumption that the rich man would have fulfilled all duty had he dressed Lazarus' sores and fed his hunger. True charity is more than playing a coin to a beggar. It is not spasmodic or superficial. Ameliorations such as food and medicine are necessary, but there is a more fundamental neighborliness, which is the barometer of the soul, an indication of the attitude of one's heart that is prized in the sight of God. Any person, regardless of income, can show forth God's love to a neighbor. This is an opportunity that each of us has during our lifetime. We do not save this up for just special times during the year, but we offer this love freely and often so we may become the good stewards of God's creation, God's people, and God's love and mercy for all. Let us pray again from Stephen Shakespeare. God of Abraham, Moses and the prophets. Your covenant binds us as sisters and brothers. Help us to overcome the scandal of poverty, the fixed chasm of indifference, and to recognize you and the wounded poor. Through Jesus Christ, 
the builder of bridges. Amen.